And good morning, Gloria Day, and welcome to worship uh, today again online. It is great to gather and to be able to gather in this way as God brings us together, wherever it is that we find ourselves today, uh, by the power of his Holy Spirit. Of course, we gather knowing uh, that we live always under the umbrella of God's love and grace. And so this is the day the Lord has made. We rejoice and we're glad in it. Again, welcome uh, as we are here together in this way to worship God and to praise Him. I'm excited today that we're starting a two-week series. Pastor Chris is going to take the lead on a series uh, entitled The Freedom of a Christian, and uh, he'll jump into that more in detail as he brings us God's message today and next week as well. But I uh, just want to say a uh, blessed uh, Fourth of July weekend to all of you uh, as well, and uh, wherever it is that finds you, we give thanks to God for the many blessings, including the freedoms that we have in our country uh, and give thanks to God for uh, all that God does in and through our lives. I have a couple of announcements to make today. Uh, one is that uh, you probably have seen uh, an email or seen it on our website or Facebook page, but we are uh, resuming in-person physical gatherings for worship on the weekend of July 18th and 19th. If you want details and guidelines about that, you can find a link right on the very front page of our website. So go to our website and you'll find uh, the guidelines and details. But I want to remind you of our schedule. We are going to be worshiping at uh, our normal time on Saturday evenings at 5 p.m. But then we're going to add a third service on Sundays to uh, just enable us to spread out the numbers and to be as safe and cautious as we can. Uh, so we're going to be worshiping on Sundays beginning Sunday the 19th of July uh, at 8.15, at 9.30, and 10.45. And those worship services will be approximately 45 minutes in length uh, each one, so a little bit shorter than usual, but uh, we'll be good to get together uh, if you feel safe and comfortable and gathering one. Once again, know that you indeed are invited. The 815 service will be uh, masks required, so all congregation members that come at 815 will be wearing masks. You can either bring one from home or we'll have uh, disposable masks available for you uh, as you enter the building. At the other worship services, we are strongly recommending masks, but certainly uh, won't be required at those others. But excited about that, and so uh, mark that on your calendar and hope that uh, works for you and your family if indeed uh, you're feeling good and safe about gathering once again. And then another announcement uh, dear to my heart is that we are planning two golf scramble tournaments and just want you to be aware of those, uh, Sunday, July 26th and Sunday, August 30th. Both of them will be one o'clock starts, tee time starts. We're going to be out at Spring Creek Golf Course and so if you want to put together a team uh, you can sure do that, uh, or as an individual, or twosome, or whatever that might, be, might look like for you. Uh, call the church office. You can register uh, by calling in or going to the website and registering online, too. Uh, but all are welcome to participate. Uh, Spring Creek Golf Scramble Tournaments, Sunday afternoon, July 26th, and August 30th at 1 p.m. But again, uh, welcome as we are here to worship and to sing praises to God. So uh, let's begin by uh, singing together, uh, He Reigns. One, two, three. Thank you. 
morning, Gloria Day, and we'll begin our worship this morning together as we always do. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. And we'll take a moment to lift up our hearts together in making our confession this morning and hearing God's word of forgiveness. Please pray with me. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you, and for his sake God forgives you all of your sins. To to those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. Amen. We'll join together as we sing the song of praise for your glory. A one, two.
Our first scripture lesson for the day comes from Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 26. Paul writes, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction since all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, they are now justified by his grace as a gift. A gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness because in his divine forbearance he passed over the sins previously committed it was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hi kids, we're counting blessings again, and our number this week is the number... You know, I don't know what the number is this week, and I bet you don't either. Our number is the number of hairs on your head. Do you know how many hairs are on your head? I sure don't. But you know who does know? God knows how many hairs are on your head. And that's kind of a silly thing for God to know, but God knows everything about us. He knows the things that we think, and the things that we say, and the things that we do even those things that aren't so good. So when we've done something wrong, we don't need to hide from God and be scared. He loves us all the time. And he wants us to tell him about those things that we have done wrong. That's called confessing. That way we can think about it and not do those things again. And we can remember that he has forgiven us for those things that we've done wrong because we've already told him about it. And then we can move on and try to do better next time. God loves you all of the time. Let's say a prayer and thank him. Dear God, we thank you that you know everything about us, even silly things like the number of hairs on our heads. Thank you that we're able to tell you the things that we've done wrong and know that you will forgive us. You always love us, and that's amazing. Amen. I'll see you again next week, right here. And our gospel lesson for today comes from John chapter 8, verses 31 through 36. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And they answered him, Well, we are the descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? So Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household, but the son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ.
Well, Gloria Day, I want to again say uh, welcome to worship and glad that you're here with us in this way. Uh, And we're looking forward to uh, being with you again sometime soon. Um, I want to start today in prayer. So please pray with me. Lord God, we give you thanks for the goodness of your son, Jesus Christ, for his work on the cross that he won victory over sin, death, and the power of evil in our lives. And we give you thanks, Lord, for the free gift that he has given us in this, the free gift of salvation and freedom from sin, death, and the power of evil. Lord, we ask that you would bless us this weekend, and we give you thanks for the gift of our country and this uh, wonderful place that we get to know that we are... uh, your children, this place, Gloria Day, where we are called by you to be your hands and feet and your disciples in this world. Would we ask that you would bless all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to start today with a a short uh, story, just kind of retell a a story that is, I think, fairly well known, maybe to many of you. It's new, but I want to tell it and and let's see if you know it. So there's a dog to whom a butcher had thrown a bone, and the dog was hurrying home with his prize as fast as he could go. As he crossed a narrow footbridge, the dog happened to look down and saw himself reflected in the quiet water as if in a mirror. But the greedy dog thought he saw a real dog carrying a bone much bigger than his own. Now, if he had stopped to think, he would have known better. But instead of thinking, he dropped his bone and sprang at the dog in the river, only to find himself swimming for dear life to reach the shore. At last, he managed to scramble out, and as he stood, sadly, thinking about the good bone he had lost, he realized what a silly dog he had been. I'm sure many of you smart Gloria Day folks know of Aesop's fables. This is one of those fables. Maybe you remember these fables from your childhood or you've even read them to your children. We have a book of Aesop's fables at our house and it's one of our kids' favorites. But this fable is um, one called The Dog and His Reflection. And I I retell this famous fable because it was a favorite of Martin Luther. And you know Martin Luther was the, that German monk who uh, back in the 1500s had uh, a little bit of a problem with the Catholic Church and uh, through many writings and debates and all sorts of things it eventually uh, that problem led to Martin Luther being excommunicated from the Catholic Church and started what we now know as the the Lutheran Church, or even the Protestant faith. Um, His protests and the protests of those who followed him, of course, against uh, the abuses of the Catholic Church, led us to uh, this denomination that we're a part of, for sure, and many other denominations, too. But Luther loved Aesop's fables. One of the things that he loved to do was Uh, to translate them into German so that people could read them and uh, experience the joy that they are and kind of learn their lessons. And so in uh, the year of 1520, it was a year before Martin Luther was put on trial by the Pope Leo X in the German town of Worms. And uh, Martin Luther wrote a letter to the Pope And so this letter, it it had three main purposes. The first thing was that this letter uh, Luther wrote wanted to clear up some of the confusion with the Pope about some rumors that Luther had attacked the Pope's personal character. So Luther was writing to him to clear up some rumors that it wasn't actually his personal character that that he was attacking um, in his letters and in his teachings. And second, Luther's letter intended to make peace with the Pope because actually Luther had made some personal attacks, but it was uh, personal attacks on the Pope's theologians 
and particularly a man uh, named Eck. And finally, this letter that Luther had included a small theological paper that he wrote to the Pope about Christian freedom. And so it was in this small theological paper that Luther included this famous fable of Aesop, all about the dog and his reflection. And it's so interesting to me that uh, Luther included this paper along with this letter to the Pope because this paper became one of the most important theological writings that Luther ever wrote, or at least he thought so. Um, And so in it, he includes this fable, and Luther said about it, uh, anyone can see how the Christian is free from all things and is over all things, so that such a person requires no works at all to be righteous or saved. Instead, faith alone bestows all of these things in abundance. Now, Luther says, if someone were so foolish as to presume to be made righteous or free or saved or Christian through any of their good works, then such a one would immediately lose faith along with all other good things. Luther was saying that this famous fable of Aesop's had a lesson to teach about the Christian faith. And that lesson is this. You cannot set yourself free. You cannot set yourself free from your sin. The dog in the fable tries to reach out and grab the bone in his reflection in the water. And in doing so, he drops the real bone in the river. And so like the dog, we cannot reach out and grab salvation and freedom for ourselves. You see, the butcher in the fable is the one who gives the dog the bone. And so like the butcher, God has already given us real salvation, real freedom as a gift Real salvation and freedom are gifts from God. If you you try to reach out and grab them for yourselves, if you think that somehow through your good works that you can save yourself or earn your way to heaven or experience God's freedom from sin, then there's, you are just like the dog who drops the real deal in the water thinking that you can reach out and grab it for yourself. It's 4th of July weekend in the United States, and we're celebrating, hopefully in a physically distanced kind of way, we're celebrating our freedom in this country from Great Britain, right? But the kind of freedom that we're celebrating this weekend is not the kind of freedom that Luther had in mind, and neither did Jesus. This was an entirely different kind of freedom that Luther was writing about. He was writing about Christian freedom, Christian liberty. What are we free from, Luther asks. And then what are we free for? I think one of the maybe the most dangerous misunderstandings in American Christianity today is that we tend to associate American freedom with Christian freedom. See, the problem with that is that American freedom began with a rebellious spirit and people who hoped to become unchained from the burdens of serving a king. But Christian freedom, on the other hand, begins with the king himself. We are subjects of the king, and as Christians, we kneel, acknowledging that no earthly king or reign is more sovereign than the king, Jesus. And so at first glance, it might seem like the idea of American freedom and Christian freedom are the same, but they're not because we are actually subjects of the king, And so, 
We are in his good grace and mercy. At first glance, you might think that being subjects of a king is no freedom at all, that actually if you are subject to a king, then that means you don't have any kind of freedom until you realize what you've been freed from because of Christ. In John chapter 8, Jesus is talking to a group of Jews who've already come to believe in him. He says to the Jews, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Jesus then goes on to say, very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. So if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Christians and Christian freedom begins with the assumption that we are sinful. As Jesus says, we live as slaves to sin. And it doesn't take too long for most of us to search our past or even our present and see that we are not perfect I mean, if we're really honest with ourselves, if we really take the time, like our friends in AA, to take a searching and fearless moral inventory of our lives, if we really think about it, we all know the truth about ourselves. And it's pretty ugly. We're sinners, we are failures. We mess up, we make mistakes, we hurt others, we hurt ourselves, and we hurt our relationship with God. So if you were to hold up a mirror to our entire lives, or like the dog in the story, if you were to look at ourselves in a glassy river, in the reflection, we would see the dim truth about who we really are, that we are sinners and we are chained to the weight of that sin. We are not free. And we cannot free ourselves. We're bound to sin. We're shackled. We're chained. We're stuck. We're trapped. And if we look at the reflection of ourselves, we'll see the worst of who we are as human beings. And it's important to be honest about that, to be honest with ourselves that we are sinners, that we do hurt others, that we do hurt ourselves, and that we do hurt our relationship with God, that we all make mistakes. And again, if we look at ourselves in the mirror, if we were to hold up a mirror in front of our lives, we would see that's exactly true. Except that you need to remember that what you're seeing is only a reflection of the truth. See, the real truth, the truth with a capital T, is not what you see in the mirror. The truth is Jesus Christ himself. Remember, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And so like the dog in the fable, we can't reach out and grasp for the reflection of truth because that's not the real deal. That's not the the real truth about who we are and who we belong to. Martin Luther says that the real truth is that God is like the butcher who's given the bone. God's the one who gives us something to really gnaw on, to chew on, something that will fulfill our hunger. And if we reach out and try to grasp at the reflection of the truth, then we're missing the truth. Luther says the Christian individual is completely free, Lord of all, subject to to none. Because of Christ, Luther is saying, because of Jesus and what he did on the cross for you, because of him, you are free from the chains of sin 
and death and the power of evil in your life. You are free. You are truly free from those things. You don't have to live under the weight of sin or death or evil anymore. Every chain that has once kept you from God has been broken. And it's all a gift. God has done it all. The Son has set you free, and so you are free indeed. And that is the gospel truth. Not the reflection of the truth, not some dimly reflected truth of who you are, but the real truth of who God says you are. That's amazing grace. Luther liked to, to call this idea the happy or the joyous exchange. In that little theological paper that he wrote to the Pope, he says that every weight of sin has been lifted, every death has died, all the power of evil has been overcome because Christ exchanged sin, death, and the power of evil for righteousness, salvation, and freedom. Christ took all of that sin, death, and the power of evil from you and put it upon himself. And in exchange, he gives you not more sin and death and evil, but he gives you every good thing, his righteousness, his salvation, his freedom, a happy and joyous exchange. Christ on the cross takes all of the sin, all of the death, and all of the evil of the world and says, that's not the truth. I am the truth. And everything that I have belongs to you. Luther uses a metaphor to explain this. And it's a metaphor of a bride and groom. Roman marriage law made a, a a distinction between property or something that one owned and possessions, something that one had the, the full use of. And so in a marriage, the property of the one spouse would become the possession of the other and vice versa. So Luther's saying, like a marriage, like a bride and groom, Christ has exchanged and taken all of your property, your sin, your death, and the power of evil in your life, and exchanged it or taken it as his possession. He's saying, what's yours is mine. And then he says, what's mine is yours. Righteousness, salvation, and freedom. It's like a bride and groom who exchange rings on their wedding day. Christ takes the property that belonged to you for himself and gives you his. He exchanges it, and he's happy to do so. Jesus Christ wants to take your sin, wants to take the death, wants to take the power of evil out of your life. He wants to take it and hang it on the cross and give you every good thing that he has all of his righteousness, all of his salvation, all of his freedom. What's mine is yours. What's yours is mine. And you belong to me, Jesus says. So let me end by actually doing what Luther says that preachers should do with the truth of the gospel. One of the final things in this section that Luther says in that little paper to the Pope is that the gospel should actually do something to you. It shouldn't be just such a nice story that sits on the page or a nice story that you hear about Jesus from a preacher, but a preacher should actually tell you the truth. You see, the truth is, when you look in the mirror, you see all of your mistakes. You see your mess-ups. You see your sin. But don't pay any attention because it's a reflection. 
You are not the sinner that you see dimly lit in that mirror. You are not your failures. You are not your mistakes. You are not your mess-ups. You are not the worst thing you've ever done. That is not the truth. The truth is that you are the bride of Christ. You are wonderfully and beautifully made in the image of God. Christ has taken that dimly lit truth about who you think you are and given you exactly who you are. Child of God. One who is free. See, if you can hear that for yourself, you will be like some of the men in St. Dismas, our prison congregation, the penitentiary of South Dakota. I once heard a story of a pastor who was there uh, pastoring and ministering to those men on the hill. And one of the men just could not give over the fact that he had messed up so bad that he had ruined everything in his life. He, his relationships were gone. His, his freedom was gone. He was stuck in prison. He was going to be there probably for the rest of his life. And he looked at himself in the mirror and thought, there is a miserable sinner, somebody that God cannot forgive. And the preacher looked at the man as he told his story and said, you are not that man in the mirror. You are not the worst thing you have ever done. That is not your identity. The truth is that Christ died for you, for your sin. And because Christ died, and because he was raised, you have real freedom. You might be stuck here in this prison for the rest of your life, but you have the only freedom that matters, and that is the freedom from sin. You see, friends, the Christian faith, Christian liberty, Christian freedom is a freedom from, first and foremost. We are free from sin and death and the power of evil in our lives. Those things no longer bind us. They no longer chain us. We are completely free. We are made free through the blood of Jesus. You are not the worst thing you, are, you have ever done. You are not your mistakes. You are not your failures. You are a child of God, so be free. So now that you know that you are free from I hope that you'll come back next week and hear what you are free for. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now may the peace of God, that peace that passes all our understanding, guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I want to invite you again today to... Um, Give an offering, uh, not only of financial gifts, but of your, your life, your prayers. Your whole life is an offering to God. And so today, we offer ourselves to God and we give him all that we have, our lives and everything in them. And we share with God in God's goodness. There are a number of ways that you can give to Gloria Day right now. You can send in a check. You can mail it to us. You can also send it in through our app or online, or you can swing by the church office when we're open and we'll gladly receive an offering. Thanks so much for your generosity, for the ways that you give, and you continue to support the ministry of Gloria Day. So let's sing together. <laughs>
And we believe and trust in the triune God, so let's uh, make a statement of our belief, what it is that we believe, uh, by using today, once again, the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And please join me in prayer. God, we are so grateful that you are a God of love, that you're a God of truth. And you've given us your son to show how much you love us. Jesus, the one who has been given to be our Lord and our Savior, not only for us but for this world. And so we pray today that you will fill us with that word, with Christ, the word made flesh, and inspire us through your written and spoken word to know Jesus, the one who sets us free from that which binds us, and the one who enables us to live in the freedom to love you and to love one another. And though we are absolutely free in Christ, inspire us to live not just for ourselves, but for the well-being of others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Good and gracious God, we thank you for the gift of your church, for the very bride of your son, Jesus. Give us hearts and minds that are open to your will to carry the gospel to all people, inviting and introducing them to the life-changing news of your love. Continue to strengthen this congregation and your church around the world in its many expressions. Empower us to be your instruments in our families, workplaces, and wherever it is that you call us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And as Christians, God, we know that all good gifts come from your gracious hand each and every day. For food and clothing, for home and family, daily work and all we need from day to day, we offer our thanks. And on this 4th of July weekend, and always, we are grateful for our country, for the freedoms that we enjoy, for the women and men of our military, for our political leaders, for our police officers and first responders. Keep them safe and give them your wisdom. And we ask you to embolden each of us to stand up against racism and violence and any form of evil wherever it exists and to work for the good of all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray also today, Lord, for all those who are sick or imprisoned, for those who are grieving or who are lonely or hurting in any way, for those who are hungry or in need of shelter, Bring healing to this world, to a world caught in this pandemic. And we pray for healing and comfort for those that we name in our hearts before you. And Lord, may we never forget that we are blessed in order to be a blessing to others. And may we know each day your presence in our lives. And may we give ourselves fully over to you, holy God, and to your ways in this world. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For all these things and for whatever else you see that we need, we ask and pray in the name of the one who sets us free, Jesus Christ our Lord, the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And now let's sing together, God Bless America. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.